This is The Befuddlement Draft, written by a yellow marshmallow and read by Lala's Podfix. Chapter 5 Despite the events that took place leading up to their OWLs, Harry and Draco always found time to continue their late-night meetings on the Astronomy Tower. Sometimes Draco would talk, sometimes Harry would talk, other times they would simply enjoy each other's presence. Draco insisted some of these meetings be study sessions. Not that Harry was complaining. Draco's thinking face was adorable. Harry always made a trip to the kitchen before he arrived, especially after discovering Draco had a soft spot for anything sweet and knowing that if he brought along jam tarts or chocolate eclairs, Draco would be more inclined to help him with his potions essays. However, as soon as Dumbledore's army was discovered, it became harder to meet with Draco, and Harry hated that their meetings were becoming less and less frequent. He knew that Draco missed him too, and that was why Draco had suggested some study sessions, so they'd be able to meet more frequently and not feel as guilty about it. Nothing, however, distracted from Umbridge's tyranny. As much as they tried to ignore her existence, as soon as Fred and George left, the atmosphere became chaotic and depressing, with everyone trying their hardest to get rid of Umbridge, but no one having the same planning expertise. These careless pranks were one of the reasons it was difficult to sneak to the astronomy tower. Once, Harry got catapulted into the ceiling after setting off one of these pranks, and Draco told him that he had had similar experiences. Ron and Hermione always picked up on his chipper mood, smiling with him. It made a change to see Harry smile so effortlessly, and it usually happened after a meeting with Draco. This was the only other time they saw Harry relaxed. The other time was when he was at the burrow. Occasionally, when there was no one else in the common room, Ron or Hermione would ask about Draco, and Harry would grin, replying with a simple, good, before returning to his studies or the game of exploding snap. Harry should have expected it to happen eventually. If anything, he was surprised it didn't happen sooner. However, being pulled into an empty classroom on the way to the Great Hall was not when nor where he expected it to happen. Harry instinctively reached for his wand, but his hand froze before he reached into his pocket when he saw Parkinson and Zambini, clearly attempting to be somewhat intimidating, but after facing Voldemort, nothing else seemed particularly threatening. Potter... Parkinson greeted coldly. Zabini rolled his eyes and rubbed the bridge of his nose as Harry rubbed the back of his neck, a tentative smile tugging at his mouth. Honestly, Pansy, you can be nicer, Zabini muttered, shaking his head as she huffed, still glaring at Harry, who shifted on his feet. Lovely to meet you properly, Potter, he said, flashing a grin at Harry. Harry blinked, baffled at the difference in response, and nodded at Zabini, shaking his outstretched hand. Draco told us everything, so you don't have to worry. Harry felt his shoulders relax. Of course Draco had told them everything. It was the most likely conclusion, but he still felt wary around the Slytherin duo. And if you're playing with his feelings, Potter, I will skin you alive and hang you by your throat off the astronomy tower. Parkinson smirked, her eyes venomous. Harry felt his mouth go dry. I, I'm not, it's, he said, stumbling over his words. Don't mind Pansy. She tends to opt for the dramatics. Zabini chuckled as Parkinson swatted his arm. The sentiment still holds, of course. Slytherins protect their own, he explained, still flashing a dazzling smile. This unnerved Harry more than Parkinson's direct threat. But she means well. I still think Draco's an utter idiot, (sighs) Parkinson sighed, and Zabini laughed. But he's quite taken with you, Potter, she said, and Harry felt himself blush. The feeling's mutual, Harry chuckled managing to speak for the first time since he'd been pulled into the classroom. Sabini raised an eyebrow, his smile softening. Parkinson unfolded her arms, her glare looking less murderous than before. "'My threat still stands, Potter!' Parkinson shrugged. "'Don't even think about hurting him, understand?' she asked, raising an eyebrow, and Harry grinned. "'I don't think I could if I tried,' he said honestly. "'He's making it very difficult to threaten him,' Parkinson muttered to Sabini, making Harry laugh." Draco's been brighter recently, Zabini said, glancing at Harry as if trying to figure him out. No doubt because of you in part, so thank you. Harry furred his eyebrows. He wasn't like this before? Parkinson let out a burst of high-pitched laughter. Salazar, no! He was distant and cold and, well... She paused, gesturing with her hands. He received some news over Christmas, but he wasn't surprised. He'd been expecting it all year, she said, her eyes flickering to Harry to watch his reaction. Harry sighed, nodding. He told me, Harry admitted, and this was the first time both of the Slytherins lost their composure. He failed to mention that, Zabini said, his eyes narrowing, looking as venomous as Parkinson did moments ago. And does that change anything? 
Of course not, Harry said, snapping his head up to meet Zabini's eyes as Parkinson watched him, as if examining him. It's not his fault his dad's a prick. (sighs) He sighed. Zabini laughed. Well, you're right about that. His father's a complete prick. That's an understatement, Pansy drawled, rolling her eyes. Do you remember when we were four and that blasted peacock pecked at my arm and he was more concerned about the peacock? Pansy shuddered. Mother is still upset about it. Chuckling, the Slytherin duo glanced back at Harry, who was watching their interactions curiously. Their friendship was different from those he had with his fellow Gryffindors, but it reminded him of Fred and George. If Fred actually listened to George, and the two of them managed to keep their cool. Parkinson smiled at him for the first time since Harry had been dragged into the classroom, and surprised Harry by wrapping him in a gentle hug. "'You're all right, Potter,' she said, smiling as she took a step back. "'Not who I would have chosen, but I suppose I can see why he's so smitten.' She smirked, as Harry smiled, blushing profusely. I agree, you're both clearly mad about each other, Zabini grinned, and Harry chuckled. Don't tell him that. I think it would upset him to know he's mad about me, Harry joked, feeling a sense of satisfaction when Parkinson snorted. These two were important to Draco, and he wanted to get along with them. Merlin, he'd be mortified, Pansy chuckled, and Zabini raised an eyebrow, amused. Let's do it! Harry grinned as the two Slytherins made a mental note to tease Draco later. We won't keep you from the Great Hall any longer, Potter. We know that Gryffindors are sticklers about food, Zabini said, glancing at Harry. You can call me Harry if you want, he said, watching with amused eyes as the two of them wrinkled their noses. I'll call you Harry on my deathbed, Parkinson deadpanned and Zabini nodded. And don't you dare call me Pansy. There may not be any disdain between us, but it's weird. You can call me Blaze, but don't expect me to call you Harry, Blaze added, and Harry snorted. Wouldn't dream of it, Blaze, Harry grinned. Blaze sighed as if it was painful to hear, and Parkinson chuckled. You brought this upon yourself, Blaze. I don't know what to tell you, she smirked as Blaze rolled his eyes. I suppose I did, he sighed once more. Harry felt his stomach rumble and knew if he were much later, Ron and Hermione would ask him an unjustifiable amount of questions. Tell Draco I said hi, he smiled, heading to the door. Don't forget about the threats, Potter, Blaze called out, just as Harry reached for the door handle, and Harry bit back his laughter. Harry woke up in a cold sweat. He needed to get to Sirius. He needed to leave now. Are you all right, dear? That was quite a noise you made, and you look very pale, the invigilator asked, a frown pulling at her face as Harry's eyes darted around the room. Harry realized he was on the floor. Headache, stress, Harry said, bouncing a hand on his leg as he stood up. He needed to go right now. Oh, you poor thing. These exams can be rather intense, she replied, her gaze full of pity. You can leave if you finish. I recommend a rather long nap and perhaps a trip to the hospital wing for a calming draft. She smiled, and Harry did not hesitate in leaving, grabbing his bag on the way. He needed to get to the ministry, but how could he get there? He could fly, but that would take too long. He needed to get there as quickly as possible. He didn't trust the flu system in the Gryffindor common room, not since Sirius's call got interrupted, but perhaps the fireplace in Umbridge's office would take him to the ministry without killing him or alerting anyone? It was a bad plan, but the only plan Harry had. He changed his direction, walking to the Gryffindor common room to retrieve the Marauder's map. Merlin on a dragon, Harry, wait up! He heard a voice yell from the end of the corridor. He turned to see Ron and Hermione bounding towards him, looking as if they'd ran around the whole castle. What? How did you? Well, Hermione finished the exam ages ago and just said she had a headache, Ron interrupted, smiling slightly as he tried to catch his breath. Hermione blushed. But I said it'd be best for someone to escort you to the hospital wing or common room, just in case. Yes, well, we didn't exactly lie, but that's beside the point. Harry, are you all right? What happened? Hermione asked. You just collapsed and started, well, muttering, she said, glancing at Ron, who nodded to confirm the story. It was bloody terrifying, mate, especially when you know that's what your you-know-who dreams are like, Ron added, shivering at the thought. He has serious, Harry responded, and Ron's eyes popped out of their sockets as Hermione pursed her lips. Harry, are you... Honestly, Miney, I don't care, because if he does have Sirius, he will kill him, and I can't lose Sirius, not yet. I can't just, he's mine, he stumbled over his words, pulling at his hair. Fuck, Hermione, Harry yelled at no one but himself. Okay, what's the plan? Do you know where he is? Ron asked softly, knowing how much Sirius means to Harry. Hermione nodded. Yes, we can't head there without a plan. Harry took a deep breath, smiling at his friends. I'm going to the ministry, and to do that, I need to get into Umbridge's office, to use the flu. So we need a distraction, Hermione added, looking lost in thought as she tried to figure out what would be a decent distraction. 
Perhaps we could get Jenny, Ron exclaimed as he noticed Jenny, Luna, and Neville engaged in conversation, sat on the ledge in front of one of the windows in the corridor. She saw some of Fred and George's fireworks. She never leaves the common room without them, Ron explained, upon seeing Harry and Hermione's befuddled expressions running up to his sister. And I saw some nargles the other... Jenny, tell me you still got the fireworks, Ron interrupted. Bloody hell, Ron, why do you need them? Jenny asked, glaring at him as he'd yelled down her ear. You can flirt with Luna later. This is important, Ron insisted. And Luna and Jenny both went pink as Neville glanced between the two, baffled. Yeah, I do, but why do you need them? She asked, now more reluctant to hand them over. Harry didn't want to explain the dream, but he did explain that he needed to get into Umbridge's office to use the flu, and to do that, they needed to get her out of her office. Course we can do that, Jenny grinned, jumping to her feet and dragging Neville and Luna to theirs. Anything to fuck with Umbridge. Jenny, Ron exclaimed at her language, and she shrugged. Harry wished that Umbridge's office was closer to the history of Magic Classroom, and not on the other side of the school. His mind was filled with thoughts about Sirius already being dead. A lot of time had passed since his dream, and every minute standing and doing nothing was another minute of Sirius being tortured to death. Potter, Harry heard someone exclaim as he walked into them, turning the corner. Everyone except the trio stiffened, poising for a fight. Harry, think Merlin, Draco said, noticeably disheveled as if he ran here. When you fell to the floor, I, I wanted to leave, but you wouldn't allow it. Not after Weasley and Granger. Are you all right? What happened? He asked, one hand on Harry's shoulder as the other brushed Harry's hair from his eyes, resting on Harry's cheek. Why the fuck is Malfoy here? Ginny asked, still ready to fight Draco at any sign of danger. She hadn't heard the conversation between the two boys as Draco only spoke loud enough for Harry to hear him. Ignoring Ginny, Harry leaned into the blonde's touch, shaking his head. He has Sirius, and I need to, I have to save him, he said breathlessly, and Draco pulled him into a hug, pressing his lips to the top of Harry's head. Seriously, what the fuck is going on? Ginny asked, looking at Malfoy in incredible disdain, as if she wanted nothing more for him to spontaneously combust, as well as in bewilderment. Ginny, we'll explain, but now isn't... Ron began. No, no, why in Merlin's name is this pretentious git here? She sneered, her eyes narrowing as Malfoy sighed. Outstanding vocabulary, Ginevra. I'm impressed you know what that means, Draco replied nonchalantly, turning his attention back to Harry, who was staring at him with a raised eyebrow. What? Don't be rude, Draco, he scolded, lightly flicking his forehead. Draco pouted. She started it, he insisted, and Harry rubbed his temples, not wanting to deal with this right now. Noticing Harry's scowl, Draco stiffened and muttered an apology. As the rest of the group started to argue, Harry hoped Hermione and Ron would be able to explain Draco's arrival. Harry and Draco continued their own conversation. Are you sure what you saw was real? What if this is the plan I overheard? Then... Draco paused, and Harry saw the cogs turn in his brain. How do we know this is real? He asked, his eyes searching Harry's. Harry hadn't thought much about whether what he'd seen was true, just like he hadn't thought much about a plan. He knew he had to get to the Ministry. Harry certainly hadn't considered Draco's warning about links and prophecies and creature. Then he remembered, I can check, he whispered, thinking about the mirror shard in the bottom of his trunk. He grasped at Draco's face and smashed their lips together as an excited thank you. Merlin, Draco, this is why I love you, he grinned at the blonde, unaware of the gaping mouth surrounding them, and turned back to his friends. Love you too, Draco muttered, appearing slightly dazed. Right, so Umbridge can now be plan B. I have a better plan, Harry announced, walking back in the direction of the Gryffindor Tower. Ron and Ginny continued to argue about Draco's presence for the entire walk back to the tower, and whilst Harry was glad Ron was sticking up for Draco, despite the fact he had never spoken to Draco, Harry knew the fighting was infuriating. Harry clenched his fists tighter and tighter until... Weasley, will you shut up before I force you to? Draco snarled, his head snapping towards Ginny. I understand your dislike and distrust, I really do, but now is not the time, he snapped, turning to ignore any further protest she spewed. Except she didn't. Draco's words seemed to draw her attention to the frown on Harry's face, and how he leaned into Draco, lacing their fingers together, the frown lessened. The group half ran, half quickly walked to the Gryffindor Tower, and the portrait lady reluctantly let Draco and Luna inside. Thankfully, the common room was empty, and the eight of them clambered up the stairs to the boys' dormitory. Mate, how is this going to be helpful? Ron asked, as Harry began to throw things out of his trunk. I hate to agree with Weasley, Harry, but how are you planning to check that Sirius is at the Ministry? Draco asked, placing a hand on the crook of Harry's back, just as he grabbed the mirror shard, jumping up to sit on his bed. Without explaining himself, Harry looked at the shard and said, Sirius Black, watching as his reflection rippled away into what appeared to be the ceiling of one of the rooms at Grimmauld Place. Sirius! He called out, and he called out again when he got no response. 
Master Harry, Creature said, picking up the mirror shard. Creature, Harry exclaimed, catching the attention of those in the room with him. Creature, I need to know, is Sirius there? He asked, holding his breath. Master Sirius is not home. He is out, sir. Every word Creature spoke made Harry feel sick with dread, which was when Draco plucked the mirror from his hand. My name is Draco Malfoy, he said, and Ron chuckled, amused that Draco's go-to in every situation appeared to be to reveal his name. Draco scowled at Ron, who instantly flattened his expression. Son of Narcissa Black, he said, looking at Ron, who suddenly seemed to understand why he said it. Harry watched over Draco's shoulder as Creature stiffened. Master Draco, he squeaked, and Draco sighed. Creature, tell me the truth. Is my cousin Sirius Black at home with you? Draco asked, and Harry saw Creature's ears flatten as he grimaced, unhappy that he had to do what Draco asked. He is home, sir, he mumbled, angry at himself for telling Draco the truth. Harry felt his entire body relax and his eyes sting. Sirius was safe. Draco let out a sigh of relief, too, and everyone in the room seemed to follow suit. Could you take this mirror shard to him, please, creature? He asked, smiling as the house elf nodded and snapped his fingers to apparate. Ginny's eyes, as well as Neville's, had widened at Draco's polite tone because it was directed at a house elf. Harry could see that Ron and Hermione tried to act unsurprised, but they both failed miserably. Luna caught Harry's attention as she smiled dreamily at the two of them, grinning as she made eye contact with Harry. She was the only one besides Harry who was unsurprised that Draco was not an asshole. "'Master Sirius has a call, sir,' Creature said as he appeared in the same room as Sirius, tossing the mirror shard to the ground, but thankfully Sirius caught it before it landed. "'Harry! Oh, Draco? Why are you calling? Is Harry okay?' Sirius asked, squinting at the shard. This interaction only made the rest of the group more confused. When had Sirius had time to meet Draco? This mirror is marvelous, Draco muttered, clearly already coming up with a list of spells needed to create such an object. Harry is fine. Well, it's better if he explains it. Sirius! Harry called out, his voice breaking as Draco handed the shard over to him. You're all right! You're really all right! He asked, needing to hear his godfather say it. He could just hear the rest of the group muttering in the corner as Draco left the bed to give the two a moment. Of course I'm safe, cub. Why wouldn't I be? Sirius asked, trying to sound calm and playful, but his eyes betrayed him. I had another dream, and you were at the ministry, but Voldemort was torturing you, and I don't want you to. I'm glad you're alive, he said breathlessly, trying to control his breathing. Hey, hey, take a breath, cub, Sirius said, placing down whatever it was he was holding. As you can see, I'm not at the ministry. However, that dream, he muttered, his eyebrows drawing together. It's from Voldemort. My scar is hurting, Harry said, rubbing his fingers over his scar. That's bad, Sirius stated, and Harry rolled his eyes. Thanks, I hadn't figured that out yet, Harry said, and Sirius ignored the comment, continuing. I'll alert the order, but Harry, you must stay at Hogwarts, all right? You can't go off to the Ministry just because this trap was set for you, Sirius said, his eyes scanning Harry's face as he looked away. Only if you promise not to go either, Harry said stubbornly. Sirius's expression darkened slightly. Harry, he began. Please, Sirius, Harry insisted, his eyes still avoiding Sirius's own. They sat in silence for a minute, and Harry watched as Sirius struggled to give Harry the answer he wanted. Harry knew Sirius hated being trapped in Grimmauld Place, but he needed to know Sirius was safe. I won't go, Cub, if that'll keep you at Hogwarts, Sirius sighed reluctantly. Thank you, Harry mumbled, smiling faintly at his godfather. Sirius sighed again. I'll talk to you later, Cub. After I've talked to the Order about this, but stay at Hogwarts, he instructed. Merlin knows what Remus would do to me if I let you go to the Ministry by yourself, he added, talking to himself.